Tony Breidinger is a NASCAR driver. She's also a Victoria's Secret model. Think about that. Those two worlds couldn't seem to be more opposite. So how did she do it? I sat down with her for a one-on-one -on -one interview where we talked about that, plus her social media following and how she's more popular on Instagram than any other NASCAR series competitor, including Haley Deegan. We also visited about her future in NASCAR and just how different it can be on the racetrack for a woman when racing in a field full of men. I'd like to welcome to the channel, Tony Bridinger. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with me today. Of course. Talk to me a little bit about what was going on today with the $100,000 check from Canes yeah. for the Women's uh, Sports Foundation and just mentoring the girls and why you would participate in something like that. Yeah, we had a really special day. Um, I invited 12 girls to come out and drive go-karts for the day. Um, they got hooked up with some free race gear. And they just got to kind of hang out with each other um, and meet other girls in the sport that maybe they haven't met yet. Um, so it was a really cool, special day just to get all the women in the sport together, the future of the sport. And um, Raising Canes um, gave a check to the Women's Sports Foundation um, of $100,000, which was very generous. And um, it's definitely going to move the needle for a lot of women in sports. So, um, yeah, it was a very special day, very heartwarming. I grew up racing go-karts. So just even speaking to the girls today, like it was so relatable and almost nostalgic to talk to them about my journey, my path. Um, so, yeah, it was a very special day. It's something I've been wanting to get back for a while. So it was cool to finally be able to execute something like that. Talk to me about that journey, because I know I've read multiple articles, Tony, and it started when you were nine. So I understand your father took you to the go-kart track. Just tell me that little that story and how it all played out for you. Yeah, so it's funny because I had no idea anything about racing. I don't even know if I knew what NASCAR was at the time when I got in my first go-kart. Um, but basically, my dad was just driving to work one day, saw an advertisement for go-kart classes at Sonoma Raceway. And it was during winter break, so me and my twin sister, Annie, really had nothing else going on. And he's like, hey, do you guys want to go drive go-karts for a day? And I was like, yeah, it sounds so fun. And I remember when we got there and I was standing over the go-kart, I was like, oh, this is what a go-kart is? I was like, I said yes to this, and I don't even know what I got myself into. Uh, and I didn't even know what side was the brake, what side was the throttle. Um, so it was a whole new experience for me, but I ended up falling in love with it, and so did my sister. And we begged our dad to go back to the go-kart track and he ended up getting us one. I think it was like for Christmas or something like that. And um, yeah, we just go up every weekend and it was really just a way for my dad to kind of spend time with his two daughters and bond with us. And um, I kind of took it to the next level. I was like, I want to be a race car driver. And my parents had been very supportive of it. Uh, but definitely they kind of thought it was going to be a phase for sure. It's like, it's kind of like what kids say, oh, I want to be a race car driver. But yeah, I stuck with it. So I've read all these stories about you sticking with it. What happened with your sister? How long did she pursue it? Yeah, so she's kind of speaking about that today a little bit. So um, basically, we raced go-karts until we were, we were like around 15 years old and then started getting into race cars a little bit. And at that point, we were in high school. And my sister always knew that she wanted to go to college. And um, she's very intelligent. So she always took like honors classes and was very dedicated to school and um, you know, wanted to take that path. And for me, I was like, oh, I don't care if I miss school to go racing. Like, that's what I want to go do. Um, so basically, we raced with each other up until that point of graduating high school. She um, went to Purdue University and studied mechanical engineering. And I moved to North Carolina to become a NASCAR driver. So um, we took two very different paths, for sure. Okay, so Tony, it, it seems like when you look through your career, the last two years, it's really accelerated the pace. And so Going through the numbers, just looking at, you know, trucks, you've had the four races, two top 20s. So the question is, and I know we'll talk about ARCA in a second, but yeah. are there more plans for truck races in 2024? Um, I would love there to be. We're still kind of working some stuff out, but um, Daytona was an amazing opportunity for me. Definitely a dream come true. And um, we kind of had some bad luck in the end, didn't really get the results we wanted, but I felt like, you know, for the most part, we executed during the race and, um, yeah, I love working with Tricon and Toyota and they really believe in me. So I definitely am hoping to be back with them again this year. Okay. So now let's go to the Arkham Menard series. And in two seasons, the last two seasons, 13 top tens, four top yeah. fives, all of those top fives came in 2023. So yeah. To me, that tells me that your career tra trajectory is going upward because you're getting better results. So yep. going into the 2024 season, 
what are our expectations? Yeah, so, you know, I ran a full season in 2022. That was my rookie year in the Argus series. And then last year I ran a partial season. And I honestly didn't really have intentions of running another full season in Arca. I was kind of, you know, ready to start like moving up through the ladder system, maybe go more into like truck racing and stuff. But I feel like I had such a year of growth last year and improvement where I was like, I want to give this full season another shot. I feel like I'm not done yet. I feel like I still have so much more in me to achieve in the arc level before I kind of take that next step. Um, so I'm very excited for this season. I think um, every year last year just kind of kept building, improving, and kind of riding that wave of momentum. So I'm very excited for this season and have the best of luck at Daytona, but kind of just brushing that one off. And I'm excited to be back at Phoenix with Raising Cane's on the cards. It's one of my favorite tracks. So uh, I'm very excited for tomorrow. Do you feel like, I mean, top fives have obviously four of them last year. Do you feel like a win is, a, there's a chance of getting a victory and making a trip to victory lane? Yeah, you know, I definitely think, obviously, win in the Argus series is going to be difficult. It's not going to be the easiest of things, but I do believe in myself and my team to get it done. And, um, yeah, I was talking to my team owner about it a little bit. He's like, you're not going to know what day it is, but one day you're just going to show up to the track and we're just going to know that this is probably the day that you're going to win. You're just going to unload. You're going to be fast. So maybe it'll be tomorrow. We'll see. So I was watching, uh, looking at Twitter a little earlier today, and I saw Kenny Wallace, a clip from his show, and it was yeah. an interview with Brian Deegan. And the question was brought up talking about his daughter and, you know, Haley and the whole experience of how this is Kenny Wallace's words. And I quote, how guys abuse girls on the track. Mm -hmm. So I want your opinion what kind of experiences have you had in your career? Although I know it's short, but I mean, you've had these experiences. So kind of yeah. give me a sense of what it's like out there. And do you feel that? Because I think it's kind of obvious you see these type of things happen. I'm just curious from your experience, what has it been like? Yeah, it's funny because I feel like it's almost a touchy subject for people. People tend to get triggered when, you know, females on the spar are like, oh, yeah, this person drove me different because I'm a female and everyone usually kind of freaks out but um I do see it not even amongst just myself but you know with Haley and with some of the other girls I'm like yeah, I feel like that guy wasn't driving the other drivers like that but um he drove her a little bit different and it could have been from like past history but I do feel like I see kind of a recurring pattern where some of the drivers do race the girls a little bit harder and I don't even think it's always intentional um I think maybe it's like subconscious just kind of like the double standards in society but um, yeah, you definitely kind of have to be aware of who you're racing around. And I mean, there's people that I race around and they drive me just like anybody else. Um, and those are kind of like the best people to race around. But yeah, I feel like for me, I always just say, you know, when I'm behind the wheel and I have the helmet on, I'm a driver just like everyone else. And if somebody doesn't see me like that, it's kind of their problem. And then I'm going to just drive like I know how to drive and I'll just treat them like everyone else. So, yeah. All right. All right. So now let's jump from the actual racing to off track and sponsorship. And you know, it's so crucial. It's critical to the survival of any kind of NASCAR driver. So through the years, you know, just reading the different things that you talked about in your career, you you wanted to be a race car driver, check the box. You wanted to be a Victoria's Secret model, check the box. And now you get Victoria's Secret to advertise and sponsor you. So, I mean, it seems yeah. like just a dream sequence for you to have those two things, very different worlds kind of collaborate together. So talk to me about both of those Specifically, Victoria's Secret, how did you get them to come on as a sponsor? And I know, I think it was the 2022 I read where you did your first walk with them. I'm not really familiar yeah. with the whole modeling stuff, so you might have to educate me. But I'm just curious of how you brought those the synergy of those two very different things together. Yeah, that was definitely a very special partnership to me. I think like a lot of young girls, um, I always dreamed of like, you know, being a Victoria's Secret model when I was younger, but I also dreamed of being a race car driver. And I remember I told one of my friends, I think I was probably in middle school at this point. And I was like, I want to be a race car driver and a model. And she's like, you can't do both. And I was like, well, why can't I? And she's like, nobody's done both. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, maybe I can be the first one. And um, it's something that like, I really like set out to do, but it kind of like naturally came towards me. It's um, I'm always like really big about kind of manifesting and like setting goals for yourself. And I feel like it all kind of just blended perfectly. Like, um, you know, I focused a lot on my racing career and all that kind of stuff just kind of came with it perfectly. Um, but yeah, that was a very special partnership for me. And um, yeah, I have a great team behind me that kind of reached out to Victoria's Secret and I did my first shoot with them. 
Um, it was actually the day after I raced Talladega in 2022. Um, so just crazy racing at Talladega one day and then hopping on a plane straight after going to shoot with Victoria's Secret. It was two huge dreams for me. So, I mean, just thinking about that, Tony, I mean, you have to have like two different mindsets, right? One is an aggressive, you got to attack, attack, attack. The other one is you want to look good for the camera. And so, I mean, shifting gears, pardon the pun, but how do you approach that? I guess, I, I think I read something last year where you also did a race and you did a photo shoot, was it New York or something like that? And it was kind of like tricky on the timeline. So how do you kind of balance that? Because it is very different. And so you have to kind of go from one to the other. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things to balance, you know, even with today, like coming to Canes to shoot and, um, you know, doing the activation with the girls, but I feel like it's all part of it. Like, I really want to do a great job representing the brand. Um, and also like, you know, myself, I think just showing that I'm able to balance the two things. Um, but yeah, you kind of definitely have to be very present in the moment. That's something that I've worked on a lot is, you know, when I'm here, I'm like, present on this is what I'm doing now. when I'm at the racetrack like tunnel vision on the race so you almost have to have like two different mindsets and be able to switch it on and off really fast right now let's talk about Kane I have to to wonder and, and ask you when you're driving down the street by a Canes and you see yourself out there is it <laughs> real what is the feeling when you look over there and you go oh my gosh there I am outside of Canes yeah inside of Canes what does that feel like yeah, it's definitely surreal. Racing Canes was when I first started running ARCA, like after races when I was around, it was always our go-to stop to go to after race. Like before we get on the plane, oh, we have to make a trip to Canes. Um, so it's definitely my dream partnership. So to see this kind of come together, I'm like, oh, maybe all those times that I was eating Canes, I was kind of manifesting all this to work out. Um, but yeah, definitely a very big dream come true and very surreal. And um, it's really awesome to be able to work with a brand who not only believes in me, but also believes in women in motorsports and sports in general. Um, so yeah, it's been very special to work with them and, um, very uplifting for sure. I read somewhere, I think it was on Twitter that someone said your agent had mentioned something about cup series sponsors potentially being interested in you for 2025. Did you see that? And if you did, can you explain to me what that means? Because I'm really not clear what that meant. Yeah, there was like a little bit of confusion when that statement was made. So basically sponsors who are in the Cup Series and sponsoring current Cup Series drivers right now have reached out to us um, to kind of work with us. So it's been cool to be able to track such big brands um, and have, you know, that they have interest in us. And, you know, I think the more we can kind of move the needle for women in sports, the better. And um, it will just help kind of like the girls behind me. All right, let's move on to social and actually yes. kind of sticking to sponsorship. I was reading where you posted on Twitter. I think it was recently in the last month. I kind of went through your Twitter because that's that's what I'm on. I'm on Twitter. I'm not yes. on Instagram. So yeah. I went through Twitter <laughs> like the last month and just kind of get a sense of you coming some of your tweets. And one of them was someone had posted about sponsorship. And you said in 2018, I sent out 750 emails and got seven responses. I've yeah. seen, I've talked to multiple drivers in the past and heard very similar stories. Yeah. So talk to me about how you can overcome being discouraged when it's such a minimal response, knowing that you're trying, that it's it, it's imperative that you get this, that you have this sponsorship yeah. in order for it to work. And how what prevents you from giving up? How do you keep pursuing something that it seems almost unattainable? Yeah, I actually talked about this with the girls today. Uh, one of the questions they asked me is what was the toughest moment in your career? And that came to my mind right away. I was like, well, it was when I moved to North Carolina right after high school, not knowing anybody and didn't even know what team I was going to drive for. And I would just sit all day on the couch and send emails with no response. And definitely kind of feel like I had moments of you know, what am I doing? Am I going to make it? Um, and you definitely feel it's like very isolating. I mean, you're not getting a single response. You had no idea what I was doing. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me is I was always like, well, I can't live with a what if in my mind. I don't want to be like, well, what if I didn't send this email and they were actually going to answer me? So it kind of just kept me going, maybe a little bit of delusion too. But um, yeah, like I always was just like, well, what if I send this email and they are the ones that answer? What if this is my big break? So I just always kind of had like those what if moments. And I always told myself, you're never going to fail if you don't give up. I was like, well, I can't give up and I won't fail. So there we go. Um, but yeah, definitely difficult moments with that. And um, I was able to slowly build momentum and um, kind of have at it. But 
definitely very challenging. And I know it's a very relatable yeah. subject for a lot of drivers in the sport as well. Um, it's kind of like the, yes, kind of like a vicious cycle you get stuck in because you want seat time, but you need the funding for the seat time. And then people will be like, oh, you suck. And it's like, well, I need funding for more seat time. And it's kind of just like this whole cycle. So it's difficult to get out of, but um, it's, you know, that's why, you know, working with partners like Raising Canes is so special to me that they really believe in me and my talent are giving me that opportunity, the platform to be able to show what I can do. Right. And and so when you have a partner like Canes that believes in you, they obviously believe that you you have a future in racing, but they also see your social media following and they understand yeah. that you have an audience. So I, I, I saw, again, something else that you posted on Twitter about, uh, I think it was Adam Stern's tweet. And, you know, you looked at it and I, I was just looking at the numbers and this was, I think, from January. It was 2.1. And it looks like since then you've added 100,000. Haley was 1.5 million, so she's added 100,000. And then we have Bubba at 502, he's added 9,000. Chase, 484, he's added five. And Kyle's added five. So I don't know if you heard the conversation last year where they're talking about superstars in NASCAR. And there was a conversation with Denny Hamlin uh, talking about Jeff Gordon, because Jeff Gordon said, Denny's controversial. He embrace, embraces the black hat and the villain, and he says things that gets attention, but he doesn't want that kind of attention. Where, you know, with you, you're on social media, you say these things, you talk about your life, and we know what kind of world it is, especially when it comes to NASCAR. There's still some old school philosophy and thinking amongst the fans. So you have a burden to overcome, just like you do on the track. So Talk to me about how over these couple of years that you've built this following, 2.1 million, that's a massive following, and you talk to these folks and what it means to you to communicate with them, and then just the response and, and the community, because I know doing YouTube that there's a, a following and people respond, and sometimes those comments that are hurtful hurt, and you pay attention yeah. to the negative ones. So talk to me about just your overall philosophy on social media and how it's allowed you to gain way more followers than any cup series driver and and what it is like it's been like for you yeah I feel like I started kind of picking up momentum on my social media kind of during the COVID area everyone was you know was you know obviously at home and a lot of people were on TikTok and it's kind of when I started my TikTok account and I started sharing kind of like little tidbits of my life um and to me it was very normal but people started to have interest like oh you're a race car driver or you're doing this and I was like, oh, people kind of think this is interesting. And it's things that, you know, it's my life. So I'm so used to, and it's so routine and normal for me. And then I realized, oh, like other people don't know these like little fun facts about racing. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, for me, it was just about being authentic and really kind of sharing my story on my social media platforms. And I've been able to reach a very wide demographic. And for the most part, when I first started, it wasn't really NASCAR fans. It was people that I was kind of like almost getting into the sport or didn't even watch racing. They're like, oh, this is cool. And um yeah, so I feel like I've been able to reach like a very wide fan base, which has been really cool. And then, you know, making my truck series debut last year, I feel like I started to kind of get those NASCAR fans. So I feel like I have a very wide and a big variety of different fans. But um, yeah, it's really cool. I feel like even just like seeing like where my merch pops up. I mean, it's always like it's all over the country in like different areas. And I'll get fan mail from I got one from like Japan last week. So uh, it's really cool to have such a big fan base. And um, so it's a big variety too. I feel like I've been able to just reach so many different demographics. So, um, it's cool that so many people resonate with my story and what I'm doing. Right. Uh, going back to Twitter real quick. And I, I just had in my notes, I wrote this down, yeah. but there was a couch racer tweet about Taylor Swift. And I was uh, shocked by the <laughs> response that I saw the number of, I think it was 50,000 responded to it. Yeah. So talk to me about that tweet because you're mindful when you go and post something, you know, you're going to get a response. So yeah. when you're posting that, what are you thinking when you hit sin? Yeah, it's funny because sometimes I don't even think things will get a response. It's just things that kind of cross my mind. And then, I mean, that responds like a lot of people kind of gravitated towards it, which was so funny because it was just like a little thought that popped in my head. I was like, oh, well, me, I love Taylor Swift. Um, but it is funny. It's cool because sometimes we'll just tweet like, you know, random things and um, yeah, people just gravitate towards it. So it's like, oh, that's kind of fun to see that um, people kind of care and want to have like conversations with me and kind of gravitate towards what I'm tweeting. But um, yeah, I was like, well, I love Taylor Swift. So I was like, it's the first thing that popped in my head. And um, usually I'm pretty filtered about what I tweet, but 
um, I was like, this is like, just like a little, it's like a word. So. <laughs> All right. So Tony, five years, 10 years, do we have a roadmap? Do you, you talked about manifesting. So I know awesome. putting stuff out there, thinking it, being positive that you're going toward that direction and that goal. Where do we see ourselves in five, 10 years? Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that you're into manifesting because I myself, I always talk about it. I can go on about it forever. Um, but yeah, it's funny because I always, I have a lot of goals, but I don't always set like an exact timeline on them. Cause if you asked me five years ago where I wanted to be in the sport at this age that I am right now, I would have been like, Oh, I'd be in the cup series already, which obviously I'm not in the cup series. So I feel like it's almost hard to put timelines on your goals. Um, so for me, you know, I have like my five-year path that I would like, and I'd like to be in the Cup Series, like at the end of that five-year path. But I'm also, you know, I want to be able to achieve everything at each level. Like I want to be able to race in the Arca Series, you know, get wins, get a championship and be able to contend for wins in the Truck Series, get some wins and kind of like methodically move up through the ladder system. I don't want to feel like I have to rush. Uh, I want to feel like I've achieved something and I kind of deserve and feel confident in my next step. I don't want to jump into an Xfinity race that I'm like, oh, well, maybe I'll get a top 15. It's like, I want to be able to make that jump and be like, oh, I feel like I can go out there and, you know, really execute and perform. Um, that's kind of like why I also decided to stay back in the Argus series for another year, just so I can really feel like, you know, when I make that jump to running a full season, you know, hopefully tracks that I can really be up there contending and executing. Do you feel like there's extra pressure because we've had Danica, and she was successful, you know, she won or didn't she won the the IndyCar race in Japan. But I mean, Haley's had some limited success. It feels like sometimes that these women are almost rushed. So do you are you mindful of that, trying to avoid something similar where you you're methodical, like you said, and you can build that confidence. And I think about Ryan Blaney and him talking about being lacking confidence last year. He wins the championship and now he's just he can't be stopped. He's finished the top three. Yeah. Top five. So confidence is a huge thing in anything in life. As a driver, it's especially important. So for you, I mean, are you mindful of that thinking? I want to take my time. I want to do this right because I only have one crack at this. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say that I compare my journey to the other females in the sport. I think, you know, everyone has their own path and their own journey. And I think um, everyone knows kind of like what works best for them and like in their current situation. Um, but yeah, for me, I definitely want to kind of take my time and pace myself and um, just kind of like what I said before, I want to make sure I can really perform and execute at each level before making that next step. I just don't see a point in myself. Like I want to be able to do, you know, a great job for all the younger girls looking up for me, for my partners, for my team. So I don't want to be kind of throwing myself to the wolves in a situation that I don't really feel like I can fully execute. So um, yeah, I just want to do well. And if that means, you know, doing an extra year in another series and so be it. All right, Tony, I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with me and talk about your career. I wish you the best of luck tomorrow at Phoenix and the rest of the season. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate it.